Thank you for inviting us. Oh, I may need to help you, oh, allow you to share your screen, all participants. All right. Yeah, I, I don't know how it works, the, the Zoom thing. Can, can just tell me when you see my screen and... Uh... Yeah, so did you did you click on share your screen? So at the, at the bottom of the Zoom, you have a bar and on this bar, you have participants, chats, share screen, and you should be able to share your screen by clicking on the share screen button. Yep. All okay. right, perfect, we see your slides. Thank you. And can you see my mouse too? When I move yes. it, yeah? yeah, all right. Okay, so, well, thank you for inviting me. My name is Stefan de Beauve, and I'm going to talk about my science popularization and independent research activities. I, I actually never introduced myself like this, but I think for today it will be okay. And uh, I've put my email address if you want to contact me later. Um, so I have a couple of different science popularization activities, but maybe the biggest one is this one. It's a YouTube channel called Homo Fabulous. And on this channel, I talk about biology and cognitive science. So the, the motto here is uh, biology and cognitive science to better understand human behavior, which I guess um, a lot of you will think it's a respectful objective. And so I talk, um, my originality is to have a, a biological and especially evolutionary biology perspective. So for instance, at the moment, I'm doing a very big series on evolutionary psychology. I think it will take me the whole year to do it, especially because I do, sometimes my videos can last like one hour. But uh, before this, I was also doing some more traditional videos. So I did videos on the evolution of morality, for instance, which was the subject of my PhD. And videos on nudge, on intelligence. Here it's uh, altruism in different species. This is neuroscience. So a little bit of uh, everything. And uh, I think I devote about 80% of my time to this activity and 20% to uh, research activities as an independent researcher. So this is very recent for me. I published these two papers in the last year or year and a half. And I will talk a little bit about it later, but um, uh, what does it mean to be an independent researcher? I don't think there is a very uh, well agreed uh, agreed upon definition, but for me, it's just doing research uh, without being affiliated to a lab or a team. And, um, and usually we, without getting paid for it. So it means you will have to find money somewhere else. Uh, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about how I got here, how I got to this uh, situation where I'm doing both uh, science popularization and a little bit of research. And then after this, I will uh, I will try to take a step back to give you tips if you want to start a, a career uh, like this one. Uh, so I started with a Bachelor of Biology and then I went to the Cogmaster. I did the first year of the Cogmaster, but I didn't really know if I wanted to do a PhD and be a researcher later. So I decided first to take a gap year. I did a couple of internship. Um, I traveled a bit. And at the end of this year, I thought, well, uh, you know, traveling is okay. You're very happy when you travel, but it's not going to answer your existential questions. And uh, maybe science can do it uh, on the other hand. So I decided, I decided to go back to Paris and to do the second year of the Cogmaster. And then after this, I started my PhD. And um, I'm also showing you this to show you that I started very early to uh, to try to learn different skills and to do other activities than research. And for instance, in the first year of uh, the Cogmaster, I started doing uh, coding projects, uh, paid coding projects. So basically I was building websites and selling them. And this was a way for me to pay for my studies in Paris, but also to try to plan for the future because uh, I didn't really know if I wanted to be a researcher. So I, I always wanted to have a plan B. And for me, uh, building websites and coding and programming in general was the plan B. 
And then during my gap year, uh, as I told you, I did an internship in Paris. I traveled a little bit. I did another internship in UCSB. And that's also when I started blogging on homofabulous.com, the website. So we're talking, I don't remember which year this was, but at that point there was no YouTube channels or actually no, no science YouTube channels. It was only about blogs. So I started doing this during my gap year. Then I, come, I came back for the second year of the Cogmaster and during my PhD, I did a mission doctorale, uh, which was called the Saventurier. So, uh, I don't know if you all know about Mission Doctoral, but basically, and I don't know if it has changed, but um, basically during your PhD, you can try to devote a certain amount of time to activities other than research. And usually you will teach at the university, but you can also choose to do science popularization uh, activities. And I chose to do this one, Saventuriers. So I went to schools in Paris to do research activities with kids. And I'm also talking about this because it's uh, very important that you build a network. And for instance, uh, when I did this, uh, these activities, it was the first year of the Saventurier program, but now it has grown a lot. And sometimes I see job offers to be, uh, to be part of this uh, Saventurier program. So if you start now doing other things that, than research, maybe, you can, uh, maybe it will be easier later for you to, to do some science popularization. Um, all right, so um, at the end of my PhD, um, I decided I, I didn't want to do a postdoc. So my PhD went really well, I have to say it because, uh, well, I heard about other experiences and my experience was really good. But there were two things that I didn't really like about uh, doing research my whole time. So the first is about all the negative aspects of research that I guess uh, a lot of you know about. So the, the pressure to publish or perish or uh, the lack of job opportunities or I don't know, the time you spend writing uh, grant proposals. And uh, I didn't want to do all these boring aspects. And also I was thinking that I was getting too specialized by doing research. I wanted to keep being curious and learn a lot of different things. And because when you do research, you have to be uh, uh, on the top of your field. You're not really able to learn uh, a lot of different things. So I thought maybe I could uh, learn different things by doing science popularization. And that's why I decided to not go for a postdoc, but instead go for three different activities. So the first one was um, coding. Um, so as I told you, you remember that I told you uh, during my first year of the Cogmaster, I did coding projects. And because I did this, I was able to start again very quickly at the end of my PhD and maybe a couple of weeks or a couple of months right after the end of my PhD, I was able to earn a living with this activity. And also, which is very important, I was making enough money that I was able to use this money for my other activities. So science popularization and research, even if as I told you, research is very recent, I was, I was not able to do research for quite a few years because uh, all my time was already into science popularization and coding. And especially regarding science popularization, I was the president of the Café des Sciences uh, organization for four years. So it's a nonprofit organization bringing together different uh, actors of the science popularization world online. I also created a YouTube channel called uh, La Main Baladeuse. It was it was actually my first YouTube channel. Homo Fabulous was not my first YouTube channel. I had this one before and it was more generalist. I was not only talking about cognitive science. I was talking about biology, mathematics, physics. And for different reasons, it didn't really work. Uh, it didn't really find its audience. So in the end, and also I wanted to talk about the subjects in which I had an expertise. So that's why I, dis I decided in the end to create this uh, Homo Fabulous YouTube channel. So um, like maybe uh, one year and a half ago, I was at this point, but I was starting to think that I really wanted to do research again. 
And also I thought that the time I was spending in doing coding activities was not time really well spent. Well, I liked coding, but I, I thought my time could be better spent into if, if I could spend it in science popularization and research. But of course I needed the money from the coding activities. So what I did is I asked my subscribers, so the people following me on my YouTube channel, if they wanted me to go full-time on science popularization and research. And if yes, if, if they would be willing to support me financially. So I opened a crowdfunding page on UTIP and TP. And I was very lucky because a couple of hours later, I had a lot of, uh, uh, I, I already had a lot of money on this account and my, sub my subscribers promised me to give at least 1000 euros each month which is uh, not much, but it's also a lot at the same time, especially when you compare this to other YouTube channels, because I will come to this in, in a moment. It's very, very difficult to make money with a YouTube channel. And um, that's it, that's me at the moment. So my life at the moment is, is spent between my science popularization activities on YouTube. And this is an activity that is remunerated only uh, because of crowdfunding, because of people giving me money to, to do this activity. And the rest of my life, I spend it on research, which is not uh, remunerated. And in the future, if I could, I would like to link these two activities. So for instance, I would like to do research with my subscribers. The goal would be either to use them as subjects in a psychology experiment, but I could, what I would really like to do is to do a citizen science project with them. So basically to use them as research assistants and then to, uh, to publish a paper together. And we would have, I don't know, hundreds of names on the, on the publication. That would be really cool. And by the way, I'm always looking for people to help me doing this kind of uh, citizen science projects. So if you have some time or if you have some skills like uh, uh, data analysis skills, uh, feel free to contact me. All right, so let's take a step back. Uh, if you wanted to start a career like this, could you do it yourself? I think, um, I, think I would have to say no to this question, to answer no. And why? Because it's, it's really, really difficult to make money in this area. It's a very competitive area. And so for instance, this is a paper I published a couple of weeks ago. And in this paper, I sent a survey to 140 YouTubers, science YouTubers, and I asked them different questions, but I asked them questions about their money, if they made money and how much. And so what I learned is that 50% uh, of them had a negative uh, overall uh, financial balance, which means that they lost more money than they earned during their, uh, their whole uh, activity since the, the creation of that channel. And uh, more specifically, I learned that 44% uh, of them made no money at all, and only 12% of the YouTubers make more than 1,000 euros a month. So it's very difficult to make money, and you can also uh, see this here. Um, when you see that more than half of the science YouTubers you can watch on YouTube are employed, so they have another job, and usually this job will uh, bring them money, and they will only do science popularization as a hobby. So yeah, just to be careful, if you want to start a career like this, it's going to be uh, quite difficult uh, if you cannot find the money from another source. And that's why I would like to summarize, summarize it like this. If you want to start doing science popularization, you could either be self-employed, so have a YouTube channel like I did. You could also try a blog, but um, it's even worse with blogs. You could try to write books, but books are very difficult to sell to. Or you could do contract work with different institutions. So for instance, sometimes universities, they, they need someone to teach a science communication course. And so you could get hired for a month or two by a university, but it's also very competitive. Or maybe a more promising way would be to be self-employed in another field than, the, than uh, science popularization. So I always uh, say programming or data analysis is good because uh, you should be able to find jobs in this area and also because you're getting paid well. So maybe you can work only 
three or four days a week and the rest of the time you will spend it doing something that you really love. And it's also good because you can basically work from anywhere. So I didn't want to add uh, pictures of where I'm sometimes working, but uh, you can guess that it's a, a really nice uh, job for this reason. And finally, you could be completely employed. So you could work in a museum, you could work in a nonprofit organization, you could work for universities or for the TV. I have a couple of friends who did this after their master or PhD. And uh, it's quite nice, of course, uh, except that usually you will be hired for one year, two years, maybe three years, and that's it. You will have to find someone else. And also, uh, if you come from the Cogmaster or a Cognitive Science Master, you will have to try to be more generalist than this, because I think it's very rare jobs where you will only talk about con Cognitive Science to your audience. You will always have to talk at least a little bit about uh, biology or maybe even physics or geology. All right, so finally, a couple of uh, tips maybe to, to succeed. So as I said, start as soon as possible. It's very important that you gain experience and also that you build your network. Maybe the network will be the most important thing uh, uh, in your career and in your whole life. Uh, don't be afraid to create your own projects. It means building a portfolio, for instance, with your science popularization projects. So I would say that if you are hesitating between starting your YouTube channel and doing a master in science communication, maybe you should start a YouTube channel, but that's only my opinion. And I never really did myself a master in science communication, but I think projects are very important. You have to show that uh, you have the skills and you can do stuff yourself. Maybe try to develop other skills also. I think it's a good tip if you want to do science popularization. So as I said, coding, data analysis, are very good and especially because if you are doing the Cogmaster, I guess you you know a little bit about how to do statistical analysis so maybe it won't uh, take you a lot of time and effort to be good at it. At it. Uh, be prepared to fail, uh, you will always fail of course in this field, uh, I failed myself a lot of times but that's okay. And then finally, forget about everything I said, because I guess you all know about the survivor bias, that we always uh, learn about the people who succeed, but we don't hear about all the people who failed using the, the same strategies. So maybe my example is not uh, the best example. And once again, I will put my email address. Uh, if Well, we will have the time to talk after, after this uh, session, but uh, if uh, you have a question later, feel free to send me an email and I will do my best to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I guess Lena, you'll present now and then we'll open the room for discussion. Yeah, okay, great. Well, thank you for having me as well. Uh, hello to everyone. So um, I'm Elena. Uh, I've done the Cogmaster three years ago. Four years. Yeah, I completed it three years ago. And uh, so I have no slides. So I'm just going to talk to you. <laughs> uh, so today I'm a journalist. So I write papers for a science news magazine about health. And also I make podcasts. That's not only science podcasts. But so what I like really is telling stories and I'm starting to discover that I like telling stories, particularly in the audio format. So this year, uh, my big project was a, an audio podcast I made for Louis Media. That's a podcast studio that I love. Uh, that was for a podcast series that's called Passage. And so this was absolutely absolutely non-scientific. So I'm going to begin this presentation by telling something about, well, by telling something I've done that's absolutely not scientific. And then I'll tell you a bit more about science. Um, so for this podcast, I basically interviewed my own family about an event that happened to us 10 years ago. Uh, the episode is called Désobéissance Religieuse. It's about identity and spirituality. And yeah, really nothing to do with science, but this project lasted about five months and I'm quite proud of it. So I wanted to share it with you. Uh, but now, well, here I am to tell you more about my background. Uh, so let's talk about it. So where do I come from? So as I told you, I completed the Cogmaster three years ago. And at first I wasn't really sure I wanted to work in research. Um, 
I was quite sure I wanted to to work in science, but I was not like really sure what to do with it. And the more I was doing research in my studies, uh, the more I was thinking, um, not really my thing. So I've done a few internships in research uh, about very different things. Uh, I studied primate communication, um, facial emotional recognition in humans, um, especially in navigation in the virtual and the real world in humans as well. So um, during the Cogmaster, I discovered uh, very different topics and a lot of different ones. So at the time, I had no clue that these things were actually going to be useful to me one day. And I, I was a little lost, but I was doing things. And, and here today, I'm working in scientific journalism. And in my job, actually, having little tips of knowledge in many, many fields and a lot of curiosity is actually exactly what is required. So I didn't expect that. But what I learned in Cogmaster during all these internship experiences actually are useful to me today. So um, I think I've always liked the idea of like transmitting knowledge and and so, but not so much find, finding out that knowledge by myself, like through research. I'm very, um, very happy about transmitting what other people found. And well, that's something I found out during the Cogmaster. And actually what I liked the most in research projects during Cogmaster was the last part was public communication. So I got involved in several little science popularization projects like uh, videos, little papers uh, for an association that's called Coginov. I'm not sure it's still Yes, it still exists today. Um, and of course, the Forum des Sciences Cognitives. So, um, yeah, I was al always doing like a little project. And I, uh, at the time, I also liked very much to do <laughs> like PowerPoints for different classes, I remember. Well, not anymore, as you can see. But yeah, I also participated in a project that was a bit uh, like aside from Cogmaster at the time. Uh, that was a TV theory project called Neurotruc that has not been released yet, I think. But the idea of this theory was to debunk cognitive science myths such as uh, like we only use 10% of our brains or some people are more left brain, some are more right brain people, etc. And so that was uh, a project that, uh, yeah, I think it, people who had done the Cogmaster before who were uh, launching this project. And they were looking for students and or researchers to help them um, to find the like, science content for this series. And well, that was the first thing I actually got paid for in science outreach. So yay, <laughs> I was like kind of happy to, to participate in this. And so there I worked on, um, on an episode. So like each student or researcher had to work on a particular episode. And I worked on an episode about uh, like how women are supposed to be uh, like good at multitask multitasking and men are only good at like doing only one task and how that's wrong and why. So like, yeah, I was doing research about this. Um, so yeah, so in 2018, I completed the Cogmaster and, and so at that time I discovered what I really like is more telling stories than doing research. So um, I also found out that I can actually tell stories while still working with science. And that's when I decided to join a scientific journalism master in Paris Diderot. So what I start to find out during this year of scientific journalism is that it's actually, it's not only that I want to tell stories and so I find a way to be able to tell stories while still making science, it's that it's actually crucial to know how to tell a story when you want to explain someone something about science or about anything really. Uh, so like basic structure is you have a um, main character and things happen to him. And at the end, this uh, hero has changed in one or in several ways. 
And well, if you apply that structure to basically like any um, anything you want to transmit to someone, well, it's really great structure to keep people's attention. So that's what I discovered during my year of scientific journalism. And, and this is really whatever the message or story you want to deliver. So I wanted to speak about that today because that's something I've never been told during my science studies um, at Cogmaster or before that in bachelor, I've done a biology bachelor. And well, I thought it could be useful to, to have this thought um, to people who are wondering about what to do with their science skills today and who might become science communicators. Because yeah, tell people stories, stories are nice. And um, so yeah, so I went to this uh, to this master in scientific journalism. Uh, so in 2018, no 2019. And the summer right before that, I spent a week in um, in a Croatian science camp for teenagers, so in Croatia. And I was there. I was tutoring science projects in ethology uh, with a friend, and we both supervised uh, five teenage Croatian girls on a research project about ants. And so for this project, we had brought like five ant colonies from France in the plane with us, but like, that's another story, but we were not really serene about the, the end, but the project were, went really great. And that's really an example of a project where I was not at all, like not confident at all in, in, in what I was going to do there, but that went really well. So if I can give any advice, it would be like to never hesitate to answer a call for projects because you don't feel confident enough. Because if you, well, if you get it, you get it. So just try and, and you will see. So then in September, uh, I entered the scientific journalism master in Guido. It was a professional master. Uh, so then I entered in M2 directly because I already had a code master. And so what was nice about it, it was that it was very uh, like technical master. So I really learned how to uh, use a mic, a sound recorder, a camera. Uh, also what was good about it is that I got paid because it was a master in alternance. So that's the master when I worked at La Main à la Patte uh, doing scientific educational videos for their YouTube channel. And so, yeah, I've got audiovisual skills. And also in, in classes, we made short movies. I, I made one about natural selection theory. Um, that's also when I started making science podcasts because the, well, the students of the master had a, an online media that was also a paper journal, actually. So we had two, two versions. It was about science popularization, science outreach. And online we had uh, videos, podcasts, and articles. So um, that's where I, I really started to do podcasting with my well, with the friends from the from the master. And yeah, I really liked it actually. I was, I think I was, I really liked the um, the thing that it was really in the at the frontier of documentary and fiction. Because the um, the podcasts we created were, yeah, but they were really stories, and we were like each of us were uh, was a character of the story, and we were telling people about science while um, inventing another universe, another atmosphere, and it was really nice to have this like kind of creative um, environment as well as like the science one. I think that's. Maybe one thing I missed in, in Cogmaster, it was like this creative fictional uh, environment. So I really liked it. So, so yeah, that's also something I thought when I, I heard Stefan said about like do a lot of projects and that's really true. I think that's by doing projects that you find out what you like and also that you create network of course. And, but that can pass by well, that can be through doing a science communication master. Well, for my case, that was that was it. So, so yeah, so do both. Do a science communication master and projects. 
Um, yeah, so um, the same year I was uh, also a student jury for Paris Science Film Festival. Uh, that's an international science film festival, which was a really nice experience. So that's also an example of a side project that it's not a lot of time, but that's really nice because you meet a lot of people. So this, I, I really recommend this kind of thing. And at the end of my, my internship at the Fondation La Main à la Patte, I did an internship in a film production company that's called Bridges. And that's where we worked on the Arte project. Uh, so that was a TV series for the channel Arte, and it's, it's still on Arte.tv, I think, right now, on the internet. It was called uh, Reconnection, Reconnection, and like more or less the idea of the series was to uh, put in relation something scientific with something apparently totally unrelated. So for instance, an episode could be like, what is the relationship between a knitted sweatshirt and an earthquake? And well, you have to go and check out the episode because I think I have no time to explain what the relationship is now. But yeah, my job here was to find the topic of each episode. So for instance, this, this topic is the knitted sweatshirt and the earthquake. Uh, to sum up the story for the film director and to find researchers' context for the interviews because it was a mix of interview and stop motion design. And so then I would go with the film director to interview the researchers as well and would be like an assistant. And so this internship that really made it clear to me that I didn't want to create science, but to create stories. Like stories about science or not, I was not sure, but science, like, I'm not, I was not sure it was that important to me anymore, but I wanted to tell stories. So the year after this, I started to make my own podcasts about health, environmental issues, like uh, feminism, family relationships. It was all topics that I deeply cared about. Um, but finding a job in podcasting per se was not that easy. So what I decided to do is a third master. So the last one, hopefully which offered also an alternance mode. So here um, I'm, so I'm still doing it today. That's this year I'm talking about. Uh, so here I'm studying one week out of three and working as a journalist two weeks out of three in the science health magazine I was talking to you about at the beginning. So that's the alternance I found at uh, Bayard Press. And the magazine is called Tempo Santé. So yeah, basically a health magazine for old people uh, the atmosphere is really nice and the topics are very diverse. So I write about news, laws, uh, politics, society, medicine research, psychology, uh, nutrition. Well, that's really good. Uh, I, also, I'm the only journalist actually in the team, well, to have a real post in the team, apart from my boss. So I get to write a lot which is great because all the other journalists that write in the magazine are pigists. So they are independent journalists who are paid for each article they produce. So um, yeah, I get a lot of responsibilities because of that. So, so yeah, and here I'd like to make just a small job interview parenthesis because I think you, you should not hesitate to like for a job interview to underline all the absurd stuff you've been doing before, like podcast about feminism or bragging about the ants you brought by playing to Croatian teenagers, even though it's just a, a health magazine you're playing for, because they can actually help you. I think you might create an interest in your interlocutor or a connection or make just make them love. And I think that's always good. So yeah, don't hesitate to say, well, say the things that <laughs> that you should be recruited for and then say the, the absurd things. So yeah, so this year I also started, uh, as Kenning was saying, I started working in um, as an independent for different, uh, different mediums, so Science et Vie, for instance, uh, which I wrote some articles for uh, just before the team went through a major crisis. So like basically a part of the journalists of Science Vie left the magazine and created a new one called Epsilon. 
because I didn't like the way things were evolving there. So I think I'm going to keep working with the former journalists at the new magazine. Um, yeah, you can ask me for more details on this if you like uh, at the end. Uh, so I also have in the non-science part, I also have a new ongoing pro podcast project with Louis Media for a series that's called Emotion. And here, well, that's actually more science oriented because um, I will interview researchers who work on empathy and they'll explain how empathy can become a toxic emotion in some people in some circumstances. So Emotion is actually a podcast series uh, produced by Louis Media that, um, that gets, uh, how to say this, like each episode treats about a different emotion. So for each episode, you have an emotion and researchers talk about it. And, and, and sometimes people who are involved with this emotion in a professional way, like for instance, um, a violinist was once interviewed for, for this, uh, this episode about the way she perceived the emotions through hearing. So uh, yeah, that, a lot of different people are uh, interviewed. And yeah, and I think I'm also working like in the science world on a science outreach podcast project for Alius. Um, maybe some of you know this group of researchers, it's an international research group that some of them work at the ENS and they study the different states of consciousness. So that's, for instance, hypnosis, sleep, uh, psychedelic induced states, etc. And here we are launching like very soon a podcast about um, all these uh, different states of consciousness that's called like what is it like to be -na -na -na. So that's going to be like five minute podcast of what is it like to be hypnotized what is it like to be um, under psychedelics what is it like to be asleep what is it like to be dreaming and so each of the researchers is going to participate in like depending on their field of research to this podcast so I think Nina, we, we yeah. need to start taking questions now. Yeah, sure. So well, uh, I think I've already, yeah, I finished. So that's good. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, the floor is open for questions. You can raise your hand or we're not that many. So if you just want to talk right away, you're welcome to. All right, Leonard, you may go first. Yes, hi. Uh, uh, thanks for the for the interesting talks. Um, I have a question um, because you told that you like science, you like uh, explaining science, you like uh, create interest in science in people. Um, so, have you thought about uh, being a teacher, uh, like biology teacher in high school? And why did you choose not to be a teacher and to do? Uh, science popularization uh, outside of, uh, of, uh, of teaching. So who are you asking to? Uh, both of you. <laughs> yes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, Stefan, do you want to answer? No, that? you can start. You can start if you want. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to think <laughs> quickly. Uh, why did I, why not a teacher? Um, I think it was like, I was talking about the, um, the creative atmosphere that I liked in the in the journalism master I've done, well, scientific journalism I've done. I think being a teacher would have been, uh, it would have been possible, but complicated to bring this creative atmosphere. Um, yeah, also I'm not sure I'm that attracted to uh, doing something that's regular. I like the diversity of projects that I can do when I'm my own boss. And yeah, there's this as well. Like, I think I really like being my own boss in the, at least in in the transmitting projects, like in the science outreach projects. If I have a boss in journalism, I think I'd like to keep not having a boss in what I like the most that is like doing popularization projects. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, a bit of the same thing. I would say two things mainly. So first, um, when you do science popularization, you have the freedom to talk about what you want. Whereas when you are a teacher, you know, 
you have a program and usually this program sucks. I mean, you cannot, uh, you cannot talk about what you want. And then the second big point is the audience. When you are a teacher, uh, many times your audience will not be very motivated. Whereas for instance, on my YouTube channel, I only talk to people who want to learn and are very uh, motivated to learn. So that would be the two big questions, the two big points, sorry. And of course the advantage of being a teacher is that you get paid every month. So this is a very big uh, selling point if you would like to do this. But uh, you know, for me, it was not enough. I prefer the freedom and to have a motivated audience. Thank you. Colin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think uh, I have a one, one question for Stefan. Uh, so I'm very interested in what you're doing um, because I have a project on science, science communication and we found that um, people often evaluate uh, scientific evidence uh, uh, based on what, uh, what they believe, uh, what, um, their ideologies, basically. So, um, uh, and I was wondering, did you uh, ever make a, do a video about gender discrimination or are you interested in, in making one? You mean gender discrimination in yeah, science popularization some, specifically? Yeah. Uh, so, so can you be more specific? Would, are you talking about people who would not believe women as much as men or what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, so uh, my project is on um, how, how people evaluate scientific evidence on, um, uh, of gender discrimination in the hiring process in, in academia. And we found that uh, people who are morally committed to, the, uh, to gender equality in society would find such evidence uh, more uh, reliable and uh, they find it true than those who are less committed. So their evaluations are dependent on their uh, moral, their attitudes to gender equality. So, um, and we want to try something uh, to like a, a manipulation on people's um, uh, their attitude, their uh, something like a moral framing and uh, it didn't work with the texts. So we, we, we're wondering whether we can do something like a video, we show them uh, the, a video like uh, uh, women are discriminated ag against in society, in academia, something like that, and whether that would change their uh, evaluations of the consumption of science. Yeah, so I've never really done this, but I, I, it's a topic that would interest me. And, uh, so I haven't worked at all on what you're talking about, but uh, something that I would like to do is to see how the different messages uh, in science popularization are received, depending on whether they come from uh, a man or a woman. And also we have this problem that uh, like in many different fields on YouTube, for instance, we only have uh, 15 to 20% of uh, women. So only 20% of all the science YouTubers are women. And so we'd like to understand this. So maybe I will try uh, to start a research project in the in the future to understand this. Um, yeah. And how how long does it take uh, you to make one video, and um, how much evidence do you show in your no, video? Your so it depends on the video, but uh, my videos are now pretty long. I would say it's at least one month. Uh, yeah, working full time on a video. So I would typically spend two or three weeks just reading the literature and then I will write down everything. Uh, I will write a script and then I would send the script to other researcher because I try to have other people uh, read my scripts. And then you have to shoot the video. Of course, it will take just, just one day, usually one afternoon. And then you have to do the, the production, the post-production work. This can take also uh, one week, a couple of days or one week, depending on the video. So I would say in the end, something between three, three weeks and uh, six, seven weeks for a video. Uh, yeah, so my last question. Uh, if you are interested, we, we could really work on the video on gender discrimination and, and put it as the test material in, my, in our experiments. Yeah, well, feel free to send me an email if you want to talk about this. Okay, cool, thanks. 
All right, Edgar, and then Melusine, and I think we'll have to stop there. Uh, um, I'm Marius, not Edgar. So yeah. Edgar is here. Um, so I have a question for, for Stefan. Uh, thank you both of you for, for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, so I am wondering about the, um, uh, the new um, structure that can uh, welcome um, uh, new uh, like uh, YouTuber. Um, for example, you mentioned uh, like a cafe of uh, science. Yeah. Um, is it like uh, do you, what um, what are you doing in this structure exactly? Well, at first, it was just a way to meet other people doing uh, similar activities, so like like a big forum. We also tried to to have um, to organize conference conferences or stuff like this. But basically, it was first, uh, yeah, just a way to meet other people and to talk okay. about your problems. Okay. And do you think that um, uh, the the science, the le sensei, um, will be a an interesting way to to found um, like YouTuber that are popularizing the science, like in the sense that um, you say that it was very difficult to um, to um, the sense of monetization on YouTube with uh, and that was a very difficult thing. But um, like, is there like new way of funding that can be interesting? Yeah, yeah. The, so there are a couple of new ways. So I didn't talk about them, but um, so basically, when people are on YouTube, they make most of their money through first personal money. So they bring money to the table themselves from other sources, or they will receive donations. Donation is also a very big part of the money you get from YouTube. Advertisement is very small. Only the the biggest YouTubers can uh, use it. Uh, what, what do we have? Sponsors. Sometimes you can have a, a video sponsored. And uh, lately, so we've had the CNCs in the last uh, two couple of years. So for those of you who don't know, the CS CNC is a public agency and they are giving money to many different people, but they have a specific uh, uh, appel à projet, call for projects for people on the internet. And so YouTubers can ask for money like this. So it's mm -hmm. nice, it's, it's actually really nice and they can get sometimes the 10, 20,000 euros, even up to, I think, 50,000 euros, which is good. But of course, it's, it will not be enough. And uh, for instance, myself, I asked for this money a couple of times and I never received it. So, uh, well, maybe my project yes. was not good, which is definitely a possibility. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going in the right direction, I think, but uh, it will not be enough for everyone. Thank you. All right, Melusine, if you want to ask you your question, you may. Hey, uh, thank you for, for these presentations. Um, I guess my my question is about your your relationship with the research world, and the bit two part. The first one is how how do you make sure that you're still um, up to date with the latest research, or that what you're saying on your the different channels that you use is uh, is accurate. Because uh, I find it sometimes like that research goes in so many directions and so far that it's hard to stay uh, up to date. And so, do you have a sort of like informal scientific com uh, committee that you consult? And um, and the second question is about how do you feel that your choice to do scientific popularization uh, would affect your ability to go maybe back into uh, pure research later? Uh, either from your own perspective or from the perspective of other people who are like, oh no, this person is just a popularization person, they're not able to do it. Uh, maybe, Lena, you want to start? I don't know if the question is for me or Lena, but... Uh, um, so, we, we, yeah. okay. Well, uh, about the, like, how to stay, to stay up to date uh, on research, I think I definitely appreciate to have uh, to still have friends from Cogmaster who are doing research right now because that's well actually that's where I find maybe not, maybe not 50 percent but like a large part of uh, the ideas I get for articles uh, is from what my friends are doing in research uh, I also interview also interviewed some of them and so yeah so when Stefan was talking about network that's it that's like that's really useful to, to know people who are doing um, 
research when you do science communication because they can not only they can give you ideas but they can explain it to you uh, as well so and give you resources like accurate resources on some topics um so yeah but i think the most part would be getting ideas uh, from them and so yeah so they, they would tell me for instance like yeah the the latest um latest so social cognitive uh, science article that I read was so great and you should check it out and you should do a brief about it for Tempo Santé and and yeah that's how, how it goes. Yeah and same, same here I also use my network a lot if you if you have a look at my videos um, I, I used my friend my friends a lot to, to do these videos and usually what I do is I contact them before I start working on the videos and I ask them for uh, usually a systematic review, which is something that is nice because for, for the kind of job I'm doing, I don't need to know every detail about uh, every paper. I just need to have a broad view of the, of the field. So a systematic review is enough. And then when the script is uh, done, I will send it again to this uh, researcher I know, and he will just read it and tell me what he thinks about it. And for the second question, I, I don't really know because I have never really worked again with the uh, with um, like a, a completely different team of researchers, I don't uh, know, but I think as long as you publish paper and people judge you on the quality of your papers, it should be okay. And they should not, not only see you as a guy doing stuff on YouTube, but also as a researcher. And um, yeah, I think it's okay. And also from the journals, you know, I, I, tr I started signing my, my, uh, papers as an independent researcher because I don't have an affiliation. So I just can't put ONS or I don't know what's on, on the top of the paper. So I just put independent researcher and then whatever city I, I mean, I don't know. Um, so far, I've never had problems. I've never had editors saying, uh, well, you're not in the lab, so you can't publish with us. So I think uh, all of this is still brand new. Um, journals still have to adapt a little bit to it. But so far, I haven't had any major problems doing this kind of uh, activity. Well, thank you. All right, Frank, we'll ask the last question and then we'll close the session. Okay, so the, this is a question for, for Stefan. I was really interested in the analysis that you presented in your paper, your survey of, uh, of uh, people who do science pop. And so, so my question is, is uh, what, what does it take to make a living? I mean, you, you show that not many people can make a living out of it. But so my, I was thinking, okay, how many, like, how many followers do you need to actually make enough money? Uh, and so one plot that I was missing in your paper is like the, the correlation between number of followers and income generated. Could you give us some kind of estimation of how many followers do you need to, to acquire in order to, to make a reasonable amount of money? So this is, of course, the big question. And many people would like to have the answer. The, the answer is that it doesn't work like this. So for instance, I only had 15,000 subscribers and I was able to make a living, even if, as I told you, it was not a lot of money. But I know people with 1 million uh, subscribers and they will struggle to earn a living. Basically, basically, it all depends on your audience because usually people giving you money is the main source of income. So if you have a very engaged audience, people who like you and also people who are older, you will receive more money. But if your audience is only teenagers, so for instance, I don't know if you know Dr. Nozman or people like this on YouTube, um, they will not give you a lot of money directly, even if you have 1 million subscribers. So then, then you will have to find other sources of money. I think Dr. Nozman makes a lot of money, but he gets them from sponsors, people, uh, firms sponsoring the videos, and maybe also from advertisement, because when you make millions of views now, you can start getting a lot of money. But I would be unable to tell you a number of subscribers, I think. Um, Myself, my case was an exception, being able to start doing this full time with only 15,000 subscribers. I, I, I don't know any other people who did it. But usually, well, if, if I would have to give an answer, I would say if you start getting maybe 50,000 subscribers, then you will have 
uh, you will start getting offers to, to, to promote products or stuff like this. So that would be, yeah, if you want to have a gen general number. But the, cor the correlation between the number of subscribers and the, the money you're making is, is very poor. It's not, uh, it's not very interesting. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Vienna and Stefan. And thank you for everyone who came here today and who also attended the other Decad Altag sessions. So we'll be starting again probably next September. And if you have any suggestions, please feel free to send me an email or propose people or talks that you'd like to hear about. And the video for today will be available um, through Clementine, I think in the next two weeks. It'll be on the website of the deck under the deck at Tech page. So thank you everyone for coming and uh, thank you to our great speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks, bye.